January 28th, 1986. The world watched as Challenger prepared to make history, carrying a teacher into space on a mission meant to inspire a generation. But beneath the excitement, freezing temperatures gripped Launch Complex 39B, ice clung to the pad, and a hidden weakness in the shuttle's sturdy boosters waited for just the wrong day. NASA faced deadline pressures, engineers voiced fears, but the countdown pushed forward. In the next 73 seconds, disaster would strike before anyone could stop it. Why did everything go so wrong? And how did a celebrated mission unravel in plain sight? Welcome to How Did This Happen? The Challenger Launch Catastrophe. At Kennedy Space Center, the morning of January 28, 1986, arrived colder than any launch day before. The temperature hovered near 31 degrees Fahrenheit, well below the norm for Florida's space coast. Icicles hung from the steelwork of Launch Complex 39B, glinting in the thin winter sun. NASA's ice inspection team logged frost and hard ice across the service structures, noting conditions rarely seen in the shuttle program's history. No shuttle had ever flown in such cold. Inside the crew module, seven astronauts waited. Commander Dick Scobie, pilot Michael Smith, mission specialists Ronald McNair, Ellison Onizuka, Judith Resnick, payload specialist Gregory Jarvis, and Krista McAuliffe, the first civilian teacher set to broadcast lessons from orbit. Their faces appeared on screens across the country, a symbol of hope and progress. Families and school children gathered in viewing stands and classrooms, eyes fixed on Challenger's white hull and the billowing clouds of vapor around the pad. The mission's goals were both scientific and deeply public. A satellite deployment, microgravity experiments, and McAuliffe's lessons meant to bring spaceflight into American schools. For NASA, this flight carried the promise of restoring momentum to a program beset by delays. But the sharp air, the frozen metal, and the growing list of ice team findings set the day apart from any other. As the countdown pressed forward, the tension between celebration and warning was written in every breath that turned to mist on the pad. The solid rocket boosters that powered Challenger to the edge of space were built in segments, each joined by a complex mechanical seam known as the field joint. The heart of this joint was a pair of rubber O-rings pressed into grooves between the steel tang and clevis, one ring as a primary barrier, a second as backup. At liftoff, these seals had to flex instantly, closing any gap as the steel casing flexed under explosive pressure. Laboratory tests had already shown the danger. Below 53 degrees Fahrenheit, the O-ring material, Viton rubber, lost much of its resilience. Instead of springing back to form a tight seal, a cold O-ring became stiff and sluggish, slow to respond to sudden force. Every booster segment was assembled with a bead of zinc chromate putty meant to shield the O-rings from direct flame. But the putty was never designed as a true sealant. Assembly tolerances allowed a tiny gap, just five thousandths of an inch, between the tang and clevis. When the boosters ignited, the immense pressure caused the steel to flex and rotate at the joint, momentarily widening the gap. In warm weather, the O-rings could snap into place and block the superheated gases. In freezing temperatures, they could not. Engineers had documented signs of trouble on earlier flights charred o-rings, soot trails, and erosion inside the joint. Each time the secondary ring had survived unscathed, but only because it was never truly tested in the cold. On January 28th, both rings faced conditions well outside their proven limits. The Challenger's right booster, exposed to the coldest air on the pad, would reveal the hidden weakness in the design. On the evening before launch, a conference call linked engineers at Morton Theocol in Utah with NASA managers at Kennedy Space Center. Charts filled with test data and flight records lay across the table. O-ring erosion, temperature graphs, warnings from past missions. Roger Boisjoli, a senior engineer, spoke first. 
the O-rings could not be trusted below 53 degrees Fahrenheit. At Challenger's predicted launch temperature, the rubber would be too stiff to seal. He urged a halt, no launch until the weather warmed. Other engineers echoed his concern, pointing to photographs of scorched O-rings from earlier flights and calculations showing how cold would slow the SEAL's response. The initial recommendation was clear. Do not launch. But the conversation shifted. NASA managers asked whether the data truly proved the O-rings would fail. The discussion grew tense, voices tightening as the minutes passed. Theocol's management called a private caucus, muting the line. When they returned, the tone had changed. The engineering recommendation was reversed. The launch was now deemed acceptable. A formal chart was updated. Go for launch. The final authorization carried the signatures of both contractor and NASA management. The warning had been voiced, then overruled. Challenger's countdown resumed with the official stamp of approval, even as concern lingered in the minds of those who had objected. Morning brought a string of holds to the countdown clock. Engineers and managers weighed the risks as the sun rose over Launch Complex 39B, ice still clinging to the structures. Pad crews worked through the checklist, scraping frost from platforms and clearing icicles from access ladders. Each delay added pressure. The launch manifest was already crowded. Challenger's flight was weeks behind schedule, with a growing backlog of missions waiting their turn. NASA's public commitments loomed large. The Teacher in Space lesson was set for live broadcast to schools across the country, with Krista McAuliffe's students watching in real time. News networks had staked out the press site, and the White House planned to mention the launch in the State of the Union address that evening. Inside the firing room, every pause in the sequence drew calls from headquarters and anxious glances at the schedule board. The shuttle program had grown used to juggling delays, each one explained by a technical glitch or a weather front. Over time, the extraordinary became routine. Risks that once halted a mission now felt like hurdles to clear. On this morning, the urge to keep the program moving, despite the cold, despite the warnings, was woven into every decision. The countdown resumed, with the clock ticking relentlessly toward ignition. At 11.38 a.m., the countdown reached zero. Challenger's main engines fired, twin plumes of white steam billowed from the pad, and the solid rocket boosters ignited. The shuttle rose slowly, gathering speed as it cleared the tower. At T plus two seconds, a thin trail of smoke escaped from the right booster's aft field joint, barely visible to the naked eye, but captured on high-speed cameras. Guidance systems tracked a steady climb. At T plus 36 seconds, Challenger hit the strongest wind shear yet recorded on a shuttle flight. The onboard computers compensated, issuing rapid steering commands. By T plus 59 seconds, the main engines throttled back up to full power. Then came the final radio exchange. Challenger, go at throttle up. Commander Scobie replied, Roger, go at throttle up. Seconds later, a bright plume erupted from the right booster, burning through the external tank. At T plus 73 seconds, the shuttle broke apart in a violent cloud of vapor and debris. Telemetry vanished. In mission control, screens froze. The disaster had unfolded in less than a minute and a half. Recovery teams fanned out across the Atlantic, mapping a wide debris field that stretched for miles. Navy divers and Coast Guard ships worked for weeks, retrieving shattered pieces of Challenger and the solid rocket boosters from the ocean floor. Each find became evidence, charred metal, scorched insulation, and the right booster's aft field joint, burned through at the spot seen in launch footage. Within days, the White House appointed the Rogers Commission, a panel of astronauts, engineers, and scientists. Their work began with a single question. How could a seal meant to withstand thousands of degrees fail in the cold? In a televised session, physicist Richard Feynman dipped an O-ring into a glass of ice water, then compressed it between his fingers. The rubber stayed flattened, refusing to spring back. 
The demonstration was simple, but its meaning was clear. NASA and its contractors redesigned the booster joints, adding a third O-ring, joint heaters, and tighter inspections. The process of accountability had started, reshaping every launch that would follow. On January 10th of 28th, 1986, Challenger lifted off from Launch Complex 39B in 31-degree weather, colder than any previous shuttle flight. Within 73 seconds, a plume appeared at the right solid rocket booster's aft field joint, and the vehicle broke apart. The Rogers Commission found that cold temperatures had compromised the O-ring seals, a risk engineers had warned about the night before the launch. Despite documented concerns, management approved the flight. Some details, including private deliberations among senior officials, remain partially redacted in official records. After the tragedy, NASA redesigned the booster joints and revised its safety culture, adding formal channels for engineering descent. Today, every shuttle mission checklist and launch decision reflects lessons learned from Challenger. As the Rogers Commission report stated, for a successful technology, reality must take precedence over public relations, for nature cannot be fooled. The Challenger disaster stands as a factual reminder of the cost when engineering warnings go unheeded.